All right. So thank you all for joining us again this week. Welcome back to Zoom into Archaeology. This is our virtual archaeology outreach programming. Um, now that we've kind of had to pivot towards virtual programming, um, obviously we can't do our jobs like we used to do right now. So this has been a good way for us to, to get everything done and uh, kind of meet our goals, as it were, as public archaeologists. Um, my name is Nicole Grenan. If you haven't seen me before, my name is Nicole. Welcome. Um, I'm very excited to have Barbara Clark here with us today. She is the Regional Director uh, for FPAN's uh, North Central and Northwest Region. So thank you, Barbara, for joining us. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things really quick. Um, I do have everyone on mute just to cut down on background noise a little bit. And I'll go ahead and mute as well once we get started so that there's no interference at all with Barbara. Um, and just so everyone knows too, I am recording these presentations. Um, there are a lot of folks who can't be here with us at this time during the week. So we've had a lot of requests to put them on YouTube. So that's where these things end up after our talks. If you wanna share that information for anyone who might be interested. Um, but recording means nothing for you if you have your video off. If you have your video on, it does record you. So usually I just have everyone turn their video off because it's a little bit easier. And that way everyone can focus on Barbara. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please do feel free to use that chat box function. It's a great way to get what's on your mind out really quickly. And that way you can remember it for the end. And once Barbara is finished with her talk this afternoon, we'll go ahead and let her answer any questions that you might have for her kind of in the order that they were typed in. So do feel free to use that chat box function. Um, and I think that's about it for right now. I'm going to pass this off over to Barbara. Thank you again, Barbara, so much. Great, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so I become a tiny little box in the corner. <laughs> But uh, like uh, Nicole said, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I may not get to them the moment you type them, but I will keep a periodic eye on them and answer them as I can. Um, I also just typed in my email address. So if anything comes up later on, you can't think of it, you all will have my email if you need it or want it. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation. Slideshows. There we go. All right. So today we are talking about climate change. And full disclosure, I am not a climate scientist. Um, <laughs> can everybody hear me okay? You sound good, Barbara. The only thing I'm seeing is that your screen may be a little bit big. Um, I don't know. Oh, no. it looks like it's not fitting in the box. Let me let me check. That may be. Okay. Nope. You're good. You're looking good. good. Yep. Okay. Good, 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 good. All right. So not a climate scientist. I am an archaeologist. I'm a lifelong Floridian. So I have seen and will be affected by climate change. No doubt about that. Already are. Um, but if you have climate questions that I can't answer right away, I will try, try my best to direct you towards some resources that might be able to answer them for you. But today we're going to focus on how climate change and sea level rise are going to affect cultural resources. And that's not necessarily something that people think of immediately when they think of climate change, but it really needs to be on our radar, especially here in Florida. Um, before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about archaeology, a little archaeology 101, as it were. Archaeology is a destructive science. Just by excavating or surveying a site, we are actively destroying it. And that's why it's really, really imperative that we use the scientific method and be very, very particular, as it were, about the way we go about excavating a site. The goal is, once we have excavated the site, to be able to recreate it via paperwork, maps, drawings, photographs, things like that, because we'll never be able to put it back the way we found it. Also important to archaeology is context, it's paramount. We, I always liken it to crime scene investigation. If you were to walk into a police station with a baggie of bullets and put it on the counter, they would probably throw a fit because where those bullets are placed within the crime scene 
help tells the story of what happened. Well, that's the same thing in archaeology. And that's why when you go to state parks and things like that, they ask you not to collect artifacts because you're taking the context away from that object. Archaeology, a lot of people think, is about the object. But the object is really just a tool for us to learn about the people. Archaeology is the study of past people by looking at the things that they've left behind. So the people are what's really important, and those, those uh, artifacts are context clues as to what was going on. It's also really important to note that archaeological sites change both due to human and natural causes. And we're going to talk a little bit about those, both of those today. But human causes can be, of course, looting, development, things of that nature, natural causes, erosion is a big one. And that's really um, important to consider during when we're discussing climate change. And another really important thing about archaeology is public accessibility to the information that we garner. If we don't provide that information to the public in the form of museums, lectures, virtual lectures, <laughs> um, you know, websites, things like that, there really isn't much of a point because it's our shared heritage and we all have a right to learn about it. Now, sea level rise is not new at all. Geologists have been documenting the ebb and flow of the sea level for as long as there's been geology. And we know through core samples and things like that, that it has changed throughout history. Um, it, Florida is a great example of this because Florida has actually been smaller and been bigger throughout its history um, during sea level rise and um, when the sea level was lower. There's actually terrestrial sites now out in the Gulf of Mexico because the water has risen over the last thousand, 10,000 years. But Florida was also a lot smaller when sea level rises. And we're gonna continue to probably see Florida shrink a little bit as we move forward. But it's important to note that this is not new. What is new and what scientists con are concerned about is the rate of sea level rise. That's pretty unprecedented. So back in 2012, NOAA did a review of peer-reviewed literature, and they were looking to see what the, what the pros were saying sea level rise projections were going to look like. Because if you don't know how fast or how much sea level is going to rise, it really makes it hard to mitigate. Well, what they found by looking at the peer-reviewed literature is that it was going to rise from 8 inches to 6.6 .6 feet by the year 2100. Well, that makes it really hard to plan. There's a big difference between what you would do for 8 inches versus what you would do for 6 feet. So even amongst peer-reviewed literature, sometimes it can be hard to discern what's going to happen. Now, another thing to consider, we're of course on the eastern coast of the U.S., and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but for various reasons, the eastern coast of the U.S. is probably going to see more sea level rise than other parts of the country. So just kind of tuck that back in um, your file cabinet for later. So when you put it all together, of course, there is a really direct correlation between temperature rise, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and sea level. And you can see this here, and it goes back really far. And the way scientists get this data is from ice core samples, from coral samples, uh, various methods. But you can see here that there is a correlation, and it's important to look at this and you can see within the last 50 years it skyrocketed now this i found fascinating because when we talk about sea level rise we always hear about the ice caps melting and everybody thinks that that's the only thing to be considered or that's causing sea level rise but that's most definitely not the case Remember earlier I said that sea level rise was going to be higher probably along the eastern coast? 
Well, along the eastern coast, we have the Gulf Stream, which was, is going to account for 27% of sea level rise. So the Gulf Stream, I like to think of it as like a treadmill along the eastern coast. Um, it takes warm water north. As it cools, it gets more dense and it sinks and then kind of heads back south and it just repeats that cycle. Well, melting ice has disrupted that cycle. Um, it's introduced fresh water, which doesn't contain salt, obviously, and therefore it's lighter and doesn't sink as fast. So it's, in essence, creating a traffic jam on that theoretical treadmill of water. Then you also have land sink sinkage, which accounts for about 20% of sea level rise. And here in Florida, Key West in the last 50 years has sunk one inch, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you've ever been to the Keys, they're practically at sea level. It does not take much for them to flood. And then of course you have what we're all familiar with, ice melting, which counts for about 33% of sea level rise. And per year we have the equivalent of 800,000 Empire State buildings, if they were made of ice, melting into our ocean and introducing fresh water. And then you have thermal expansion. Um, this accounts for about 20%. And warm water expands, taking up more space. Thus, it pushes the sea level higher as well. So all of those factors are contributing to sea level rise. It's not just your ice caps melting. Now, how do we know this? Um, this is absolutely fascinating to me. So there are buoys off the coast of Florida. There's eight of them and then there's 14 tidal gauges. And I like to think of the tidal gauges like upside down um, rain gauges. They measure uh, the sea level uh, as it fluctuates every six minutes. And they've been doing that for 20 years. So that's a vast amount of data. And then you also have the buoys which float on top and measure ocean depth and they track um, both high tide and low tide and get daily averages for that. And then in addition to that, of course, you have satellite imagery now. There's numerous satellites up in space, including the GRACE satellite and um, the JSON-3 satellite that measure um, sea level rise as well. And they can measure it as accurate as up to an inch, which I find absolutely fascinating. Now, what does this all mean for our cultural resources, right? That's what we're here to talk about today. Culture, um, along Florida's coast, people have been living there for thousands of years. I always like to say Florida has always been a great um, oceanside resort location. <laughs> of course, your uh, definition of a resort might be quite different than what other people would consider a resort back thousands of years ago. But um, the Florida Master Site file has provided us with this map, the maps you see here. And you have one that shows historic cemeteries, and then you have one that shows um, cultural resources, which include National Register sites, historic structures, archaeological sites, and other resources as well. And you can see with a one meter sea level rise, over 16,000 archaeological and cultural resources will be impacted. With a two meter sea level rise, that's over 34,000 resources affected. So that's a lot of culture that will just kind of disappear if we don't do something about it. Um, and I also relate this back to heritage tourism. Heritage tourism is one of the biggest economic drivers for our state, in addition, of course, to Mickey Mouse and our beaches. And so it's really important that we take cultural resources into consideration when we're planning for um, climate change mitigation because they're, our, they're a big economic driver in our state. Think St. Augustine, for example. So this is a really cool tool that you can play with on your own time. Um, you can just Google the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. And it'll provide you with a map, and on the map, you can click on certain areas, and it'll give you a specific location. And at that location, you can toggle up and down to see what will happen to that specific site under certain sea level rise circumstances. So here I have the St. Mark's Lighthouse, which is located at the um, St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge in Wakulla County, just south of Tallahassee, where I'm located. And you can see what it looks like now. 
Then you can proceed to what it would look like with a three level foot sea rise and then a six level foot sea rise. And what I always like to point out, because I've had people tell me, oh, you could just kayak to it, no big deal. Well, not really. In reality, these structures would be ruined and probably not standing upright like you see there. They weren't meant to be sitting in water that long. Um, this is a National Register site. It's a National Historic Landmark, and it's a big tourist attraction to the area, so it would be pretty sad to lose this beautiful historic site. So the National Park Service has really um, done a lot to try and mitigate and see what needs to be done to save, at least document these sites. So of course, we can't move archeological sites, can we? <laughs> at least not under normal circumstances. If we could, it would be super expensive. You can't stop sea level rise. We might be able to slow some of it by, um, you know, people taking action, um, using less fossil fuels, things like that but it's probably going to happen. And so we just need to try and mitigate. We can't excavate these entire sites, but we can try to stabilize them and protect them and at least document them as much as possible and try our best to get as much data from them as we can before they are lost. And that's about, in most cases, as good as we can expect to do, because a lot of these sites, there isn't anything at the surface. There's not really a lot to look at. So they don't make super great heritage tourism sites. There's not always a lot of interest in preserving them for other uses. Um, I do see I have a couple chat questions, and I just want to take a quick look at them. Oh, yes. So uh, Robin uh, briefly mentions the Cape Sand Blast Lighthouse, which, yes, had to be moved twice because of erosion. So we already are seeing cultural resources that are having being directly impacted, and it's not cheap <laughs> to move them. And especially here in the Panhandle, a lot of these little small museums don't necessarily have the funds to be able to do that. And how many times are people going to be willing to do that? So um, something we need to really take into consideration is how we're going to mitigate these sites. And you know, what do we consider worthwhile and what we don't consider worthwhile? Um, of course, I, of course, think it's all worthwhile, at least to a certain degree. But we as a society need to figure that out. And we also, another thing I always like to point out is a lot of these sites are on the National Register. And the reason, one way the sites get on the National Register is because they haven't had a lot of alterations. So one thing that we're grappling with with the National Register is whether or not we actually change the standards that make something eligible, that will allow us to maybe put a historic home on the coast on stilts. So that way it's still there, although it's been altered, it's still there and it's still eligible for the National Register. As it stands now, if they were to put it on stilts, it would no longer be eligible for the National Register. So we really need to change our way of thinking about what we consider historic integrity. So another thing I always like to point out are the social implications of climate change. Now, yes, archaeologists study the past. But what we learn about the past and what information we garner can help us understand current events and future events and help us plan accordingly. So oftentimes, for example, a reason a group is disadvantaged is due to some historical event that took place, um, i.e. slavery, for example. Then you have um, also disadvantaged groups tend to create their own social support system because either perhaps they lack a formal one due to discrimination or due to lack of access. And in doing so, they also create a sense of place and purpose where they're located within their community. They also tend to occupy areas that are at higher risk of climate change effects, and they are less likely to have the ability to recover or remove themselves from those high risk situations. So we saw this with Hurricane Katrina, for example, the Lower Ninth Ward, which is predominantly African-American, well, 
it, studies show that disadvantaged groups tend to live in flood prone areas. And then of course we've seen, this is a great example of Katrina's because we saw people that either couldn't remove themselves from the situation because lack of transportation. And then when their homes were destroyed, they didn't necessarily have the resources to be able to rebuild those homes. And you can go to the lower ninth ward today and see that is the case. There's many, many vacant lots still today. More recently and more close to us is Hurricane Michael. Now I recently learned about the North Star legacy communities, which are African-American communities that um, come stem from plantations or uh, the enslaved or sharecroppers. And they've owned this land and worked this land for numerous generations, but one of the issues they had during Hurricane Michael is this land has been inherited through the generations in a more informal manner. So the people that own it today don't necessarily have documentation of their ownership, which is something FEMA requires for FEMA funds. Then we also had another issue where small historic cemeteries or smaller museums or historic sites that are volunteer run, don't have a lot of funds, don't have a huge funding source, um, they thought they would be able to rely upon FEMA funding to restore you know, broken headstones after the storm or flood damage to their small museum. FEMA requires that they pay up front. FEMA's FEMA will reimburse them for eligible expenses, but they don't give the money up front. And then additionally, something that we, um, they had to grapple with was once you receive FEMA funding, one of the things they require is that you be able to properly insure that property so they won't have to come back and create a cycle of FEMA trying to um, refurbish the same sites over and over again. So there's a lot of economic disadvantages and other things that really affect these disadvantaged groups. And in essence, climate change can actually increase inequality in some loca in many situations. All right. Whoops, my computer is freezing. There we go. So how can you help? Well, a lot of it is just gathering data. A lot of these sites have not been um, visited for 20, 30 years. So we don't necessarily know what we have, which makes it really, really difficult to understand how to protect it. And I see a couple um, questions in the chat and I will get to those as soon as I'm finished with this slide, I promise. Um, so one of the things FPAN did was we, um, sought to mobilize the public to help us monitor cultural resources in coastal areas. But it's also important to note, and of course I live in Tallahassee, so I always make this point, inland areas are also going to be impacted. You have climate refugees that are going to be coming inland. So you'll have increased infrastructure, increased land use. With sea level rise, there can be um, saltwater um, creeping into our aquifers, right, that we rely on for drinking so and rely on for agriculture as well. So there are going to be issues that we face inland that could also impact cultural resources inland. So I always encourage people to monitor any site, whether it be coastal or inland. I think they all have, um, they all need to be monitored because sea level rise will impact them. It may be in different ways, but they will see impacts. But the more prepared we are to quickly react to storms like Hurricane Michael and things like that, the better prepared we are to mitigate them. And the first step is always documentation. So we launched the Heritage Monitoring Scouts um, back in 2016, I believe. And these numbers are a little, little out of date, but we have, I think, close to 400 scouts now statewide, and we've monitored over a thousand sites 
But remember, the state identified 16 plus 16,000 plus sites that will be impacted along the coast alone. So there's a lot of sites that we need a lot of monitors. And if you're interested, if you go to our website, um, fpan.us, and go under programs, you'll see it there and you can sign up for it um, and become a monitor yourself. We also do HMS programming, which of course, under normal, normal circumstances, we would do it in person, but we can work with, if you know of a group, a scout group, something like that, that may be interested, we can work with them to possibly do, you know, a training via Zoom. All right, so let's get to some of these questions here. Has COVID-19 um, disrupted any mitigation activities? <laughs> COVID has disrupted everything. <laughs> um, I believe one of the things that's been a struggle for us is just um, we can't use volunteers for a lot of things right now. We used to be able to do these great um, HMS scout meetups and things of that nature where we would have people come out in groups and do monitoring activities with us in groups. And obviously we can't do that right now. Archaeology in general um, you know, it's kind of a team job. You don't go out and survey something alone. So um, surveyors have had to put in certain precautions, but there is still archaeology happening out there. So it may have slowed it down, but it's still happening. And then here's an interesting, um, you all can probably read the Zoom, the Zoom chat as well, but it says Louisiana contains 40% of America's wetlands and the state is losing its coastline at the rate of an acre every 20 minutes due to salt water, and water intrusion. Can you please talk about the impact that cutting channels through Lake Okeechobee and other spots in the peninsula is affecting Florida? I really, um, I know it is affecting Florida, but I really uh, can't speak to the specifics of that. I would suggest possibly going to the NOAA website and seeing if you can find any information there. Um, unfortunately, I just don't want to speak to it because I'm not an environmental scientist and I don't want to give you guys the wrong information, so I apologize. Um, are there any other quick questions on the chat before I take down my program? All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, but does anybody uh, have any last minute questions? No. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And Nicole, I noticed, had posted the HMS or Heritage Monitoring Scout link in the chat. Please check it out. Please sign up for um, monitoring. It's not difficult. It's something you can do with your family. We have families that go out with their kids, and you can monitor the same site as often as you want. If there's, a, you know, you only want to go to one site, that's fine. You can go out and monitor it every month. That'd be great. Um, you can also monitor different sites. So really, you can make it your own and have fun with it. It's really just a great way for us to da um, gather data so that we can start mitigating these sites. Because without that data, we really don't know what we're losing. Um, so please, I encourage you all to do that. And once things get back to normal, maybe we can do an HMS uh, workshop for everybody. But thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbara, so much. I really appreciate that. It's a really, I think, you know, obviously there are other very impactful ways that climate change um, can alter our lives. But something that a lot of people don't think about is the cultural resources. And, you know, while those probably are less important than people's lives, um, you know, certainly we as communities get a lot of enjoyment out of our cultural resources. In some ways, they're our identity as communities. So it certainly is important. So yep, thank and you. It's, I mean, the heritage tourism aspect too. I'm sure a lot of people here have been to St. Augustine and been in the fort. And I know that's one of my youngest childhood member memories. So to the thought of losing that just kind of saddens me. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> that's where I got engaged. That's one of my favorite places. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before everyone goes, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, we've got a couple of presentations coming up um, in July. And I haven't thrown up our August schedule yet, but 
Um, actually, this evening, in about one hour, I've got a presentation, Shipwrecks of Northwest Florida. If you missed it the first time, you can watch it um, again. This is for um, the Tallahassee Museum I'm doing, but it's open invitation. And then next week, I'll be talking about uh, the Luna archaeological project, some of the underwater archaeology that's gone on and some of the terrestrial archaeology as well. And then August is going to be really exciting. We have um, staff members from throughout FPAN, so people from the Peninsular FPAN or Peninsula of Florida of, in FPAN offices there. I'm um, talking about some topics from around the state, so kind of getting away from our panhandle um, kind of focus and, and learning about new topics in Florida. So I'm really excited for that. And just look out on our Facebook page and on our, um, our website, fpan.us. Um, and I'll get those posted probably in the next couple of days. So we look forward to sharing those with you in August. Um, as always, thank you to everyone for joining us for Zoom into Archaeology. Hopefully we'll see you next week. If not, um, that's fine. And we'll have this presentation posted on our YouTube channel in a couple of days so that if you want to watch Barbara's excellent talk again, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. <laughs> so thank you, Barbara. Thanks to everybody for joining us. And we'll see you again soon. All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good weekend.